Every one of those dots is a church, but they're just buildings. When did church become synonymous with buildings instead of people? When did church become something we go to, worship in, and then leave? Take away every church building in the world and the church will remain unchanged. Church is people. We see church every day, everywhere, and don't even know it. We see it in unexpected acts of kindness, in small moments of service and love. We see church in welcoming smiles, but also in grimaces of pain, burdens that are borne by friends. The real church is rarely flashy or eye-catching. What if we saw a church for what it is? What if we dreamt about the kind of church that we could be together? Let's talk about the church that we want to be, the church that God is calling us to be. When I look at us, I see past the buildings. I see a church. Well, good morning. It's good to see you. Love being here. Love this church. Glad you're here today. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us uh, right now from an off-site campus or on the internet, wherever you happen to be. We're glad that you're here uh, also. So, um, so let's pull the crowd, okay? How many of you would call yourself a risk taker? How many of you are risk takers, okay? No, you're not a risk taker if you put your hand up like this, okay? Come on. <laughs> You're just, you're just trying to go, I, I want to be a risk taker, but I, I can't get my hand up, you know. All right, how many of you would say you're a little bit risk averse? How many of you would say that? It's okay, it's all right. Just because you're, you know, God made you weird, it's okay, you know. <laughs> no, you're the way you should be. I'm, I'm a risk taker, okay, I'm a risk taker. My wife is a risk averse, and it makes a really nice con- combination. It keeps, keeps me out of jail and keeps, <laughs> keeps her life exciting, exciting, exciting. So would you agree that uh, taking a risk every once in a while helps you grow? Would you agree with that? Helps you grow? And, and it's God's will that we all grow. We all grow. There's a great, uh, so he wants to take a little bit of risk by faith from time to time. That's what I'm going to talk about. There's a great <clears throat> scripture in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8 and 9. Uh, it says this, it says, uh, talking about risk, it says, when you dig a well, you might fall in. Okay, yeah, that's true. Uh, when you demolish an old wall, you might be bitten by a snake. I hadn't really thought about that, but it's definitely a possibility. When you work in, an, an, in a quarry, stones might fall and crush you. This was written by a lawyer, okay? <laughs> I love lawyers, come on. Uh, when you chop wood, there is a danger with each stroke of your axe. This is a risk averse person, okay? I just might, you know, just, just might, that all might happen. That's, that's true, but risks help you grow. Um, they, we were recently, this is fun, uh, there's a family in church that allows us to use a house about once a year that they have here in the Charleston area where we get our whole family together for about a week and uh, happens to be on the beach, so it's kind of nice. And we, uh, so we did that a couple of weeks ago. I you know, had the whole family. You guys know I got a big family, 14 grandkids and how many ever kids it takes to produce that many grandkids, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and so we had, during that week, we had three grandkids that are uh, all about the same age. That we, We've got groups of kids, you know. I mean, we've got three of them that are starting to get ready to learn how to walk. You, you know what that's like. Uh, one of them has no interest whatsoever in it, so I'm going to leave her out of the story. I love her. I'm going to leave her out of the story because she's just not, not interested. If people carry her around, she's fine. Um, <laughs> but two other ones, one of them is like uh, 15 months old and the other one is one year old. And, um, and, and they're in this learn to walk state, which is a, a real risk-taking stage. Now, I'll show you a picture of them just a little bit. First one is, uh, uh, who do we have first? E- Ellie, I think, Ellie. Uh, Ellie uh, turned one three months ago. This is Josh and Lisa's little girl, and she's just cute as a bug, but we actually had to force this on her. Uh, you know, they always set, mama set a cake at that first birthday, and they're supposed to tear it apart. Well, she didn't want to tear apart the cake. She's kind of like this, you know, and mom helped her just a little bit, so she did. Now, the second one is Kingston. 
Now, who do you think is a risk taker, all right? <laughs> so Kingston literally, this was last week, Kingston was sucking icing through his knuckles. <laughs> you know, he just <laughs> ripped the place apart. So I thought it would be interesting for you guys to see the process of these guys learn how to walk. We recorded a little bit of it. So let's go with Kingston first. Kingston's the risk taker. Here he is. Oh, yeah, he's going to go for it. No problem. Hi. Yeah. Oh, let's applaud. Let's applaud. Yeah, it's good. Uh, whoops. Oh, okay. All right. So, he, you know, I mean, he's just all over the place. Um, and Ellie, on the other hand, is a little more risk averse. Take a look at this. And here she is, Mama. Uh, here we go. Oh, we're going to do it. Nope, nope. Nope. We're going to go back there. Okay. <laughs> well, now that's kind of a picture, really. That's kind of a picture of all of us. You know, kids learning to walk. It's exciting on one side, but it's scary on the other side. It's this whole new world. You know, I've learned how to crawl and get around by look at all these people walking, and there's this whole world available. And so if I'll just take this this first step, this risk by faith, then I've got a whole new world open. But usually they need a little reward to offset the risk, you know. And uh, with our kids, it's, you know, you know what you can get a kid to, to leave the little stool for is an iPhone. If you put an iPhone out there, because so, they know how to work all that stuff at like birth, okay? They know the numbers. Hey, Papa, what's your, what's your passcode? I'm not telling you, you know, that's grandma that loves you and lets you use her stuff. Papa doesn't let them use anything. But anyway, so... So, and it involves, it involves letting go of something that's secure, something that you know, and stepping into the unknown. And, and I thought about that. Following God is very, very similar to that, isn't it? I mean, it's exciting and scary at the same time. Anybody ever been there? It's, it involves a whole new world of possibilities. Um, usually you need a little reward to offset the risk, and the reward is pleasing God. And it's also life works better. When you, when you follow God, when you take risks by faith. And uh, it involves letting go and stepping in uh, to the unknown. Now, uh, for those of us who are here today, you've probably already taken some risks of faith, some steps in faith already. Some of you may, uh, it may have been a step toward faith. Uh, it's a risk toward coming to faith. And uh, maybe you've already taken that step or, or many of you are here today because of that. Um, maybe you haven't stepped across a line, you know, from being a, kind of a seeker, you just kind of wonder what's going on to being a believer, but there may, be, there may be something going on in your life right now that makes you take a look at life differently. And you go, you know, I've got some questions, and maybe somebody invited you to church. You're here, you've taken a step toward faith. Uh, some of us, most of us have, have probably uh, taken a step toward obedience at some point, uh, taken a risk in obedience, you know. Uh, you're, you're reading the Bible or you're listening to a message and uh, you see God's will. And most of God's will, most of God's will is written in the book, okay? Most of it's right in there. And, uh, and you see something where you need to, your, your life's going this way, you need to obey. Maybe it's, it's in a relationship, maybe it's financially, whatever it happens to be. And you go, okay, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to step out in faith and do what God is saying I should do. And, and that's a, it's like learning to walk in obedience. And, um, and then, some of us, you know, you get beyond kind of faith, initial faith and, and obedience. Then there comes leadings from God. You take a risk in a leading from God. What does that mean? That means you, you feel like God's calling you, pushing you to do something, you know? And, and uh, I call it, uh, you know, sometimes it's bad burritos. Okay, you just get an idea and the way that, you know, it's different between God and bad burritos is bad burritos go, go away and God's leading doesn't. And so you... Do I do it? Do I step out? Do I take that kind of, do I hang on back here? Do I take a step in faith? We all, we all have that. We all walk in that. But here's the problem. It's easy to become risk averse as it pertains to God. You know, in life, the more you have, the older you get, the more successful you become, the less likely you are to take risks and steps of faith. Because you, rather than kind of being a risk taker, um, you, you become a stash protector, 
You know, you, you've got your stuff, and it took me a while to acquire my stuff, whatever that, may, that might be real stuff, it might be reputation, it might be anything, and it took you a while to get there, and so you'd spend more time kind of protecting your area than you do taking steps of faith. I you know I was watching a football game the other day, and there was a team that, man, they were taking risks, and they were going after it, and they built up a big lead by halftime, and I thought, boy, this, you know, they're, they're really going to put it on the other team. Like South Carolina puts it on Clemson every year. And, and they, oh, I don't know where that came from. You got to understand, my whole family are Clemson fans, and that's how I have to live. And so I just, it just comes out every once in a while. So anyway, so, so where were we at? Okay, so, so some team was, was you know, uh, beating this other team, and, and they came out after halftime, and instead of doing what got them there, they started playing prevent defense, you know, prevent. We'll just, we'll just kind of, and you know what? They got beat. They got beat. I, th- I thought that's, that's a picture of life too. Because a lot of times we'll take risks and, and we'll get to a certain area level or whatever it happens to be, and then we start playing prevent defense. Okay, we're just going to play it safe. And the problem is, is oftentimes we lose uh, what, we, what we have. It's easy to do that as an individual. It's, it's real easy to do it as a church. I think about Seacoast, and I love this place. I absolutely love this church. And I remember the starts of it. I've told you guys a story a little bit. Um, going to a restaurant here in, in the Charleston area with Pastor Ron and Libby at the West Campus, and Debbie and I, we took a napkin. I think it was a cloth napkin, and we may have stolen it, but we took a napkin. We repented, we repented, and <laughs> paid for it. But anyway, we took a, took a napkin and, and a pen, and we began to go, what if? You know, what kind of church would we like to create here? And we started writing some things on the, on the napkin. And you know what the things were? They were what we're preaching to you about the last few weeks. I see a church. You know, it, we, we wanted to see a church that was marked by the power and the presence of, of God. We have to have that. We, want, we, we wanted a church that cared as much or more about those that we're not yet as those that already are. We wanted to see a church where everybody served, you know, where that it wasn't built on the gifts of a few, but it was built on the sacrifice of many. And, and we wanted to, to see a church where, where we, uh, we got smaller as we got bigger. All of those things. We were writing it on the napkin. This is, let's take a risk for this. And we took a risk and we sold our homes and so we moved into this area and we didn't live here before, moved kids and all this kind of thing. Many people took bigger risks than I did by far. And I remember how exciting that was. And, and then God began to bless us and some great things have happened along the way. And we, we had to take risks along the way. I remember um, multi-site. And I won't tell that whole story, but you know, we were kind of blocked from building a larger building and so we had to try something new. And so we took a risk and we did multi-site. Now uh, tens of thousands of churches all over America are doing multi-site. I get calls Every week on how do you do it? What do you do? And all this kind of stuff. And then, and then we, uh, uh, we, 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 we did the, uh, uh, we responded to God in worship. We worship differently than what we've, uh, maybe what we did before. And now there are churches all over the world that are having a response time at the end of their, their service and, and doing that. And, and then we decided we're going to plant churches. And I remember that risk. Oh, my goodness. It was like we had, uh, we had planted three churches, and we were 0 for 3. And all of them had closed. And, uh, and, uh, and I remember God dropping into my heart, how about we plant 2,000 churches? Well, that's great. They we're doing real good so far. Let's just go ahead and say, 2,000, you know. I remember saying that. You ever say something and then go, I didn't say that, did I? Oh, man, I hope nobody heard that, you know, whatever. But you know, when I said that, there were people of great gifts in the church that stepped up and said, I want to help do that. Because big vision cr- draws, you know, capable people. And, uh, and, and, and so how we're doing there, I love talking about it. We, you know, we've planted nearly 500, and over the last 10 weeks, last 10 weeks, we've planted 48 churches had over 11,000 people at their very first service with over 500 people coming to know Jesus. You know, that's, that's kind of a cool deal. I, I think that's a very cool deal. You guys are a part of that. You guys are a part of that. But, uh, but it's easy now to go, okay, 
we kind of, a lot of people are watching, a lot of people are coming. Let's kind of protect our stuff. Let's play, let's play prevent defense. Rather than, rather than doing what got us where we are, and that's taking risks. This weekend is a risk. I, you know, it's kind of fun. Uh, here at this campus and at several of the campuses, we had student ministry band lead, you know, and uh, here, I thought they did great here. These are kids, if you were here at this campus, these are kids from 14 to 17 years old, high school kids leading in worship and doing a phenomenal job doing it, just doing a great job. Would you agree with that? And uh, and I thought about that. I thought, you know, these worship leaders are going to be leading worship here for years, and some of them will go out to other places. I know one of our girls that grew up in this church was on our team, now is the primary worship leader at Elevation Church in Charlotte, and another one, Brandon, is at a ma- massive church in, up by Washington, D.C., and then Tara leads here, and then b- most of the people that lead uh, what you'd call our first string or second string or whatever grew up in this church and grew up here, and, and we've invested in the next generation, but here's the problem is, is, is we can protect the past to such a degree that we miss what God has for us in the future. And, and what we wanna be is we wanna be a church and we wanna be a people that honors the past. We, we honor this napkin, you know, maybe we'll frame it and put it on a wall if we could find it, yeah, but, but we'll honor that, we'll honor that but we are willing at any moment to risk everything to follow God in the future. And uh, you may be here today um, and you, there's a step of faith that you're wrestling with. Most of us are. It may be a risk spiritually to believe God for something that you don't currently have or you're not currently walking in. Or maybe a risk relationally to engage in a relationship with God or with people around you, or maybe even to pop the question, whatever it happens to be, or to risk emotionally. Let yourself feel something that you haven't felt in years, and it's a risk, and the Holy Spirit's just drawing you to that. So how do you take a risk by faith? That's what I want to talk about, and I want to look at a story uh, in Luke chapter uh, 19 uh, that is the story of Jesus and a short little crook named Zacchaeus. Do you remember that story? Anybody remember that? If you were in Sunday school years ago, they used to sing a song. Remember, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little... We couldn't sing it today because it's politically incorrect. But anyway, whatever. Uh, just don't, don't get me going there, all right? Uh, okay, so let's go. How do you take a risk by faith? Here, let me give you four things. Number one, get yourself in a place where you can encounter God. Get yourself in a place where you can encounter God. Look, look what happens in the story. Luke 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, which was a legal way to cheat people out of their money back in the day. Kind of is today, too, but it was worse there, worse then. And so he wasn't popular. Nobody liked him. Very wealthy, wealthy guy. Wealthy guy without friends. And uh, he tried to, get a, tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd, been there. And so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road. Sycamore fig tree. It's not a comfortable tree. Okay, I've seen him. I went to Israel. and It's not, not, a, you know, not the kind of, kind of place you want to hang out. But he did because he wanted to see Jesus. For Jesus was going to pass that way. It's kind of too... Two people in that story, Jesus. Jesus just being faithful. Jesus, he said his whole thing was about only doing what he saw the Father doing. And so Jesus probably that morning got up and prayed. And he may have prayed something like this, Father, I want to do what you're doing today. You you have a plan. You have a purpose. You have a destiny for me, for my life, and you have a destiny for today. There are probably people that you want me to minister to. Uh, There are uh, uh, lots of things I could be doing Help me to focus on what I should be doing. And he just, and he just, and he just woke up and, and he's just walking through and he encounters a guy that God is already at work in his life because he's there. Just the point is this, is, is if you'll wake up in the morning with this thought that you have a father that loves you. You have a father 
that loves you. He's invested in your success. Your success is tied up in his success. And he has, and he has work for you to do. He has a destiny for you. And he's, got, he's got people that he wants to love touch through you today. And if you'll just start your day by saying, God, I'm available, I'm here, then you'll be amazed. You'll just be amazed at the opportunities that come. Now, on the, on the flip side of that is, is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is, is a short little crook, and, and he gets up in the morning, and he wakes up, and he slips on his short little crook slippers, and he walks across his fraudulently bought marble floor, and he goes and he takes a shower, and then he gets out of the shower, and he, he goes to look himself in the mirror. He has to step up onto a step in order to do it, and he looks himself in the mirror, and he kind of cleans it off. And there's something about what he sees that day that brings regret. There's something about what he sees that he doesn't like. And he's heard that Jesus is coming. He's heard about Jesus. And he says, well, you know what? If I could just get to where Jesus was, if I could just get, get in a place where he passes by, who knows? Who knows? And so, and so he goes out of his way to get in the right place. And you know, some of us today, um, you may have done the same thing. Some part of the reflection of your life that you've seen has made you uncomfortable. It's entirely possible that, that, it, that it happened today, it happened last week, it happened a month ago, it happened three months ago, or it's been a year, two years, and, and you go, you know what, this is never where I thought I would be at this time in my life. And there's, some, there's regret, there's something about your reflection that isn't congruent with who you feel like you need to be. And so you came here, and you're hoping that maybe Jesus will come by. Well, can I tell you, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. This is a church that values the power and presence of God. And I believe he'll come, come by where you are. So first thing you do is put yourself in a place where Jesus is. The second thing you do is be ready to do something. Be ready to do something. An encounter with God almost always requires a response which will involve risk on your part. And up to this point in the story, Zacchaeus is just a spectator. He's in a tree. He's watching Jesus. Now he's going to be a participant. Here's the next verse. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name, Zacchaeus. He, he, he knew his name. I don't know how he knew his name. But there's something about God knowing your name and knowing that he has a destiny for you that really is kind of exciting. I mean, imagine Zacchaeus saying, how, how did he know my name? Guess what? God knows your name. God knows your name. He, he's, he's got a destiny for you. And so Jesus says, quick, come down. You've got to do something, Zacchaeus. You're not just a spectator anymore. I want you to do something. I want you to respond. Quick, come down. I got to be a guest in your home today. So Zach's in an uncomfortable place with a great view until Jesus confronts him. It's out on a limb, but at least he can see, you know. Usually it takes being in an uncomfortable place, out on a limb, for us to risk the future for our current view. Fear of loss is a much more powerful motivator than the hope of gain. And sometimes it takes a difficult situation. I I was in St. Louis this week. I was speaking to a group of pastors, and I had a little bit of time, and so I took a drive down memory lane. My parents lived in St. Louis for about 10 years, I think, and I lived in St. Louis. Debbie and I lived in St. Louis for just a few months, and they were difficult months for us, to be honest with you. Uh, we, were, we were kind of between, kind of between jobs. Well, not kind of. I'd just gotten fired and didn't have a job, and we were living in their basement, living in their basement, and... Um, and I went to a church. I went to church with them. And I drove by that church this week. I'll show you what it looked like. It, this was about 35 years ago. Looks like they haven't painted the doors in 35 years of that particular church. But that was the church. And I walked into it. Inner city of St. Louis. I walked, in, I walked in that day 35 years ago. Didn't have any money. Didn't have a job. Didn't have a lot of prospects for the future. And they had a guest speaker that day. And he was talking about money, generosity. I thought, well, I'll take a pass on this one because <laughs> I don't have any of that. You know, this would be a good time to sleep or whatever, you know. But the truth is I had not learned to be generous with God. I really hadn't. Um, in, in fact, um, 
at the end they took an offering and he said, you need to take a faith step in generosity here and see if, if, uh, if you don't go on a journey that you know, is going to be pretty incredible. And my faith steps were usually like this. I, I, I had just about this, this amount of money to my name. Actually, I didn't have it in my pocket. Debbie had it in her purse. I asked if I could use it. Still that way. Still, still how it works. <laughs> and so I said, how much money do we have? And it's 20, $26. At a 20 and a 5 and a 6. Now here's normally a 6. How about a 1? How about you come up here and try to do this four times in a row? Okay? There we go. Don't get testy with me now. So at least you were listening. And so here's normally how my generosity went. Here is, see if you relate to this. If I had $25, the 20 was safe. Okay. All right. And depending on how good I felt or how I was moved, it was either the one or the five, you know, that, and that's kind of how it went. In that particular week, God said, I want you to test me on some things here. So I took the 20 and I put that and I kept, I needed a little bit. So I kept the six. We had $6 to our name. And, uh, and I took a faith step toward generosity, which was the beginning of an incredible journey of generosity for Debbie and I in our lives. I mean, it really, I wish I could just stand up here and just give testimony to how God has been faithful. We're not rich people. Well, we are rich compared with the world, okay? We're not, we're not wealthy people, but God is taking care of us all, all the way along, along the line. Here's what's interesting, though, is um, I was thinking about this. In my journey of generosity, it's very easy for me now. That was, okay, God, I give you everything. And I gave him almost everything, you know. And there have been times in the journey along the way that he's called for major steps of generosity. And I find myself protecting my stash. But I got to retire sometime. Or really, where's that in the Bible, you know. But I've, I've, got, I've got, you know, we've... It, and it's good to be wise. It's good to be wise. But there are times, there are times when, when, when God says, honor the past, but I want you to be willing to risk everything to follow me, follow me. So you've got to make a step. And it may not be financially. You, you may be at an uncomfortable place right now. It may be emotionally uncomfortable. It may be relationally uncomfortable. could be financially uncomfortable. Congratulations. You are just one faith risk from taking a giant step toward your destiny. Look what Zacchaeus does, verse five. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down. Jesus said, come on. He quickly climbed down, took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. You know, if Zacchaeus would have stayed in the tree, he'd, he'd, he'd have had a great story to tell his grandchildren. You know, one day Jesus came to our town and I saw him. I had a great view, but it wouldn't have changed his destiny. He had to come out of the tree. Maybe God's calling you out of the tree. Maybe he's calling you to take a step of faith, a risk by faith. And uh, so if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to be prepared to take a risk by faith. Let me give you a third thing real quick. Don't be af- afraid to ignore the critics because they're, they're going to come. That's the next thing that comes into his life. I'll read the scripture. Um, it says this. It says, uh, but people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. There were critics. And you know what? They probably had a right to be critical. It's, it, it would be like if today, if, uh, you know, let's say a Billy Graham, if he could get around, or a Rick Warren, or, you know, one of the great, you know, heroes of the faith, leaders of the faith, came into a town, and he went to eat with Bernie Madoff rather than everybody there. Remember Bernie Madoff, the guy that ripped everybody off? That's what was happening here. This Zacchaeus had ripped off probably everybody in the crowd. And some of these are good, faithful people. And rather than going to dinner with them, Jesus says, I'm going to dinner with him. And people started to grumble and complain. Now, oftentimes the grumbling and complaining can get us off track. Didn't get Jesus off track. He kept doing what he was called to do. But you're going to have critics. I mean, we've had critics. I, I remember one week, this is about 10 years ago, um, um, we, usually, uh, we usually destroy anonymous critiques, okay? Because if you'll put your name on them, let's talk about it. 
but anonymous, no, that's, you know, that's just, we, we should usually destroy them. And somehow, I got a hold of an anonymous critique, and it was written, actually, on the inside of an offering envelope, which told me that the person that wrote it didn't use it for its desired purpose. But, uh, so, so it was, in, and I'll, let me read it to you. I kept it, because it's so, I, I've got this in a prominent place, because I like it. Um, it says, my first time here, the preacher had a good message. I thought, well, okay. However, howevers are difficult. Howevers are, he said, he needs an extreme makeover. Preacher needs an extreme makeover. It's difficult to listen to anyone who uh, keeps their hands in their pockets constantly. Uh, that's in parentheses, constantly. Take some speech classes, exclamation point. A farmer shirt with tacky jeans, what a disappointment. No respect, no thanks. And that's what it said. What a blessing. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> now, what was funny is we've got a pretty, pretty large online viewership, and somebody on the online viewership that week sent me an email. Didn't know this, about this, but sent me an email said, that shirt you were wearing this weekend, like it, love it, got to have it, can't find it. You know, and so it's like... <laughs> schizophrenic here, you know. So what you do is you learn to ignore the critics. Now, not everybody, not everybody. You, 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 you can't, uh, don't ignore everybody because Proverbs 15 and verse 22 says, plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. So if you're one of these people, I'm going to take a risk, but I'm not going to tell anybody about it. Usually you're afraid what anybody else will say. And uh, you could be in for a rough ride. What you need to do, you need to bring advisors, wise people around you that will give you counsel. So don't ignore everybody. Who do you ignore? You ignore people who are not wholly invested in God's plan for your life. You ignore people who jump to conclusions, quickly jump, ju uh, judge motives. You ignore people who have an ax to grind, who are easily offended. You ignore people who can only see one point of view. You ignore people who won't own their own criticism, anonymous letters. I had a guy, when we started this church, it was a risk. It was a major risk. I had a guy that wrote me an anonymous letter that not only wrote, didn't sign their name, but they clipped out letters from the newspaper to form the deal. I mean, it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Talked about how, whatever, I won't tell you what he said, but it was fun. So, 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 so don't engage that. Don't engage that. What, what do you say? You say, you might be right. You know, that's how to end an argument. Now, I hate to say that because I say that a lot, and it doesn't mean I'm ending an argument. It might, I, I might actually think you're right, but you never know what I do, you know. But you might be right. You might be right. So you may be taking a risk by faith. Put yourself in a place. Here, God, you've responded. You've begun a journey or increase, you know, whatever. It, it, and, and, and you've encountered critics. Um, if you go through that, let me give you the fourth thing, last thing. Be prepared to step into your destiny. If you'll respond to God by faith, listen, most of the time, God doesn't drop you into your destiny. You've got to step into it. Did you get that? In other words, it's a, it's a step of faith. He doesn't just go, woo, woo, there you are, it's beautiful. No, you walk through a lot of stuff, and suddenly you find yourself in God's destiny for you at that particular time in your life. Luke 19 and verse 8 says, Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. I think this was after his dinner. And he said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. So he becomes generous. An encounter with God does that. He says, If I've cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them uh, payback four times as much. He's willing to do restitution. And Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. Not just him, but his whole family. This man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Zacchaeus got himself into a place to see Jesus, took a risk, encountered critics, and then he stepped in, walked into his destiny. What was his destiny? Let me give you a little nugget here. If you are a leader looking to invest in the next generation of leaders, if you're a leader looking to invest in the next generation of leaders, um, the next great leader isn't always obvious. Uh, Zacchaeus would not have been somebody who you'd say, well, he's going to be a leader in the church. Um, Jesus saw through the obvious to his hidden potential. 
And if you're going to develop people at work, ministry, at church, you've got to learn to look not just at people, you've got to look through them to their destiny. And you've got to be able to call them to their destiny. Be able to call the destiny of somebody out, rather than just, just seeing what was there. So what, what about Zacchaeus? What kind of destiny did he have? We're not really sure, but let, I did some research on it. And there's, there's a lot of theologians that believe that Zacchaeus, do you remember Jesus had 12 disciples, and when Judas kind of betrayed him, uh, they had to get another one, and they believe that Zacchaeus was the other one that they got. His name was Matthias. And a lot of people Incredible people who've studied it said that's who he was. Um, others, and some of the same, said that Zacchaeus ultimately became the bishop, in other words, the leader of the church in a city called Caesarea, which had a significant Christian presence. Whatever. I mean, it may have been, it may not have been, but here's what I do know. I do know that he became more than he was before his encounter with Jesus. And God used him to change the world. And God wants you to become more than you are before you encounter Jesus, and he wants you to change your world. Now, a message like this sometimes surfaces regrets. Sometimes surfaces regrets. You think of an area where maybe you missed God, you didn't take a risk, and, or maybe you, you took too much risk and didn't involve counsel, and, and now you kind of find yourself in a bad place, and here's the good news. Here's the good news. The good news is that when Zacchaeus woke up that morning and looked in the mirror. He may have thought his best days were behind him. And the truth was, because of an encounter with Jesus, that he hadn't even done what he would become known for. And you know what? Some of you are here today. And you feel like, you feel like, maybe my best days are behind. Or maybe God can't use me. Or maybe I can't be successful in business. And the truth is, chances are, you haven't even done what you'll be remembered for. Because if you'll take a step of faith, if you won't take, play defense with what you've got, and you continue to follow God, and you become a person that is willing to honor the past, but to risk everything for the future, God can change it. You know, I, I, I'd like to do that with this church. I love what this church has accomplished. I love what it's accomplished. And, and, and we want to be a church that, that frames the napkin and always remembers the goodness of God and where we've been. But I want to be a church now that turns the napkin over. Goes, okay, well, what do we need to risk? How do we invest in the next generation? I had, a, I had an experience this couple of weeks ago. I'll close with this. I had an experience where, you know, we've been raising up next generation worship leaders, next generation teachers, next generation leaders here. And um, I, used to, I used to think that, I used to preach that life is a marathon, not a sprint. I don't believe that anymore. I believe that it's a marathon relay, okay? That you run your relay and then you hand the baton and you, you continue to run. And uh, so we've been in that process for, you know, a long time. And uh, it used to be when I would preach, or when one of the young guys would preach, some of you guys would come to me and say, well, you know, I like the young guys, but you're really good and I wish you'd preach more. Now they're going, you know, you got to travel a little more, really, and <laughs> these guys are good, which I love. It's awesome. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. The other day, the other day, uh, but life's changing for me a little bit. And the, other, the other day, some of the, one of the guys actually sent an older guy on our staff, older by my age, in to talk to me because they didn't want to talk to me. And they said, uh, we want to redefine the relationship. Here's what we need from you. We need you to preach, you know, 40, 50% of the time at Seacoast. We need you to go and be an ambassador, you know, for what God is doing all over the world. We, we want you to keep doing that. Um, we, we, and uh, we, we, we want you to invest in us. Here's what we don't need. We don't need you to come to any more meetings because you mess them up. And, 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 and we don't need you to deal with employee issues because... <laughs> We got that covered. We're doing really good. We want you to help, help to write the, the next part of the journey on the napkin. We want you to be willing to risk it all for the future. And that's the kind of church I want to be a part of.
That's the kind of church that excites me. I don't want to be a church that just reaches one generation. I want to be a church that reaches generation after generation after generation after generation. And you know what? If we will be that, our grandkids will be well served by it. Would you agree with me? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your kingdom. I thank you for the privilege of coming together on this Lord's Day and, and just worshiping you and with this wonderful church. And now, God, I pray that you would just guide us into steps of faith, into risk-taking for your kingdom and for your glory. God, I pray that this would be moments where we would just really press in with you and seek your face. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.